Welcome to the Politics and Media Show with me, John Rees. The government has unveiled plans to increase the amount of data that will be stored on the internet use in the UK. The extra data will include people's activity on social network sites, email, internet, phone calls and online gaming. The plans are contained in the Communications Data Bill, which has been published in draft form. Home Secretary Theresa May said the change was needed to keep up with how criminals were using the new technology. And some senior police officers have said that the new measures will help catch paedophiles. However, civil liberties campaigners have branded it a snooper's charter and say the authorities should be targeting suspects and not all citizens. Well, before I introduce tonight's guests, let's take a quick look at this report. The British government wants to massively expand surveillance powers of communications okay. on the internet and mobile telephones. The Communications and Data Bill will allow the police and security services to keep track of who is calling who on mobile phones, the email addresses of all correspondents and the personal IDs of people chatting on social network sites. The bill to be announced today is likely to provoke huge controversy and has already been attacked by privacy and civil liberty campaigners who cynically note that the controversial publication comes on the day that much of the media is focused on David Cameron's appearance at the Leveson inquiry. The new powers are seen by the government, the police and the security services as essential to keep pace with innovations on the internet. Communication service providers and mobile phone operators will be expected to store communications data, provide information like the duration of calls, the time of day they were made and the location of the caller to police. Civil liberty campaigners and many lawmakers are uncomfortable with the expanded powers and say that the coalition government are U-turning on their pre-election pledge to reduce state powers in regards to snooping on the public. Civil Liberty Group Big Brother Watch described the Home Office plans as the greatest attack on the private life seen for generations. At the same time, the government's tactic of tagging criminals and suspected terrorists was this week called into question, as a report revealed that half of those wearing electronic tags were regularly breaching their curfews and were not being punished. It said in many cases, investigators couldn't even find out who was in charge of their cases, while a separate report on the £100 million a year tagging regime claimed that there were often problems with the tags themselves, as they reportedly stopped working if offenders went into metal baths or simply lived in remote areas. Well, with me in the studio to discuss this is Jim Killock, who's Executive Director of the Open Rights Group, which aims uh, to look at uh, the digital rights and civil liberties. And we also have Emma Carr, who's Deputy Director of Big Brother Watch, an organisation which campaigns to defend civil liberties and protect privacy. Um, welcome to the studio, both of you. Uh, Jim, um, how big an extension of the state's powers is this, uh, if the bill? Well, it's a, a sea change, actually. I mean, it's a huge step up in surveillance. Up to now it's been a question of uh, they, the, the police having access to information that's already been collected and stored by, for instance, your telephone company. The police have a power of access to get hold of your telephone bill if you're under suspicion. In other countries that's generally uh, accompanied by a judicial warrant. In the UK that is simply police request. This bill takes a whole matter a stage further and asks internet service providers to collect new information that they wouldn't have otherwise from all kinds of online services. And in fact, the bill essentially gives a power uh, to command anybody with a telecommunication service to collect anything that the government decides they really want to have access to. So it's essentially the government gets a power to get whatever it possibly can and then demand that that is stored for 12 months. So it turns the internet from essentially something which is uh, open and you know and does get surveilled um, in questions of a sort of suspicion to essentially in a massive panopticon where every citizen is under permanent surveillance to the extent that the Home Secretary of the day wants it. Mm. So, so there's no judicial oversight. Um, it's no. simply is it simply a request from the police to the uh, to the telecommunications operations, or is it a government request? Is it a Home Office request? So there's two steps. So the Home Office says, right, OK, British Telecom, we want you to collect all of the information from your users as they use Facebook, for instance. And then once the data is all collected, the 
uh, a police officer is authorized, any police officer may be authorized to demand from Facebook uh, the pattern of your communications on Facebook. And Facebook are legally compelled. They may not refuse, they may not say this is inappropriate, uh, they may not complain to a judge, they simply have to hand the data over to that police officer. So, so Emma, so um, are the uh, telecommunications operators um, happy with this because it's a it's, it's a massive requirement to hold everybody's data yeah absolutely and one of the questions that we have been asking the home offices is just how um, how actively the telecommunications companies have been involved in this draft bill process and we have to remember this is a draft bill this is now going to go into some sort of a consultation phase and um, hopefully they'll they'll be taking notes from um, organizations like ourselves as well as internet service providers and telecommunications companies to see how is this going to work in practice how feasible is this in practice and just what the telecommunications companies actually feel about this. Mm. So there's this side of it and as Jim says then, and then once that data is, co is collected there is absolutely no intervention, no third party that intervenes between the police request and the and the company handing over the data. Yeah, absolutely. And, and having a brief read um, through the draft bill, it's a very, very long bill, about 120 pages, which is a lot longer than we expected it to be. There seems to be uh, 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 no essence in terms of um, what's going to happen if there's a misuse of trying to gather this information and that's an extremely important part that needs to be introduced into the bill when it when it gets introduced into the house. So Jim um, you said that in, in other countries there, there would probably be um, a, a more judicial intervention in this process, a judicial stage uh, to this. Um, how does it compare though in terms of the, the, the amount of information that is being asked of telecommunication companies to store and of, uh, and of police access to that? Well, different com countries have uh, different standards and the UK has been really keen to uh, compel telecoms uh, companies to store more and more data. They have, they're in, in Europe we have something called the Data Retention Directive which says that your internet service provider has to record when you log on and off of your uh, internet account and if you use them for email uh, they have to record uh, who you send emails to and from and they have to retain that for anything up to 18 months in certain cases and this is something that that Europe has adopted because the United Kingdom pushed for it after the London bombings it said we have to use this to stop uh, terrorism so now every European country has this um, although in fact most police forces don't really use this sort of data for investigations I mean there are different ways you can investigate crimes um, in the UK we have traditionally used communications data to sort of see who people are talking to um, but in other countries sometimes that's just not how you do police work sometimes you have to say well let's use the police let's make them do the hard work and let's expect them to investigate properly those countries tend to be places like Germany uh, where surveillance and intrusive use of state power has been experienced by citizens and they know it's a problem and they have a constitution uh, as well as police practices which are uh, you know really limit the use of surveillance and intrusive uh, technologies and, and all the rest of it and the UK doesn't have that tradition we have a much too a complacent attitude about our police and their security forces. We assume that the state is benevolent and people assume that governments are never going to misuse data. I mean, I think it's time people stuck back really and just said, what's happened with Leveson? You know, what's happened with the UK media and the way that they have colluded with the police and the way that the police have just given data to the, um, to the media on pretty spurious grounds, you know, and we've had other things like, uh, you know, the way that health data about uh, Gordon Brown's children got handed again to the media. You know, this is this is a when people have access to data, um, and when it's poorly supervised, it gets abused. And what we have here is internet service providers who are not particularly good at looking after data being asked to collect huge amounts of information and then have to hand it over to the police with very little supervision I mean there's, there's every possibility that this stuff could get hacked it you know it's a great resource if you're the Chinese government you know why not go and look and see who all these companies have been emailing and you know what sort of technologies are being discussed you know there's so much scope for abuse here 
um, and we're being told that all of these risks posed to all kinds of individuals are justified on the basis that maybe some terrorists and paedophiles might get detected using this information. Mm. Well, well, let me no. just ask, uh, Emma, is there, is there any grain of truth in, in, in that argument that the increased powers of, uh, of, um, of information gathering would aid the police in, in specific cases or is, or is there nothing to that? Well, I'm supposed to, I think it's the indiscriminate collection of this data that's, that's generally the problem. We have absolutely no problem with the police going out and doing what the police should do, is targeting individuals that they've gathered evidence and um, uh, intelligence on and then tracking uh, their movements in that way after they've had a warrant from a judge. It's the indiscriminate gathering that's the problem. And Theresa May herself, I think, used the, used the example of um, the Ian Huntley case and the so murders in terms of how this will help track paedophiles. And that's just completely not true in that specific case. The police already had the intelligence to know that he shouldn't have been working in a school and that intelligence wasn't utilised. And he didn't use, uh, for instance, the internet um, to, to correspond in a way that would have led the police um, to, to know that he'd committed this crime. And so for the Theresa May to use such a, a violent and widely known example, I think it's quite irresponsible on her mm. part. But isn't this a bit like saying that you know, in the past, you know, criminals exchanged information using the Royal Mail, therefore we should open everybody's letters. Well, it's funny that you say that, actually. Within this draft bill, and you've got to remember that the Home Office have come out and said this is only about bringing technology in, um, into the current judicial system. And, but in the draft bill itself, it's talking about letters and postcards. It's talking about scanning the outsides of letters and postcards in order to, gather, in order to ascertain the who to who um, that, that, that they want to gather. But obviously, if you write a postcard, it's going to have full content on there. Yeah. When the Home Office have explicitly said they're not interested in content, Content. So it seems to be kind of a double standard on their part. So what are they interested in if they're not interested in Well, exactly. Um, it's, it's difficult to understand exactly what this information, who to who, is going to tell you unless you have um, traditional intelligence behind that. Mm. And, and isn't, it, uh, isn't, this, uh, isn't this case that it's a bit like some people say about the, uh, about the internet generally, that there's kind of too much information. Um, surely what, what if, we, if we were talking in simply in policing terms, surely what they're doing is creating a haystack and then trying to find a needle in it. Yeah, a lot of people have uh, observed this. You know, you're creating more and more information um, and then expecting that to be useful, where actually you do need to uh, examine it and really know what's going on. There's no substitute uh, for genuine human intelligence. Um, the government, I think, has got some idea in the back of its mind that once it's gathered all the information, it will be able to do automated searches and look for patterns, you know, um, who might be talking with who, is there a group of people who are communicating with people in the north of Pakistan, are they in communication with people in some other country. Um, they think that maybe by examining these patterns they will actually be able to spot uh, terrorists or, or whatever. And I, I don't think that's a reasonable argument. Um, I think it's, for instance, for a start, it brings everyone into suspicion without any actual evidence. Um, secondly, uh, it is likely to throw up far too many false positives because you know terrorists are an incredibly rare bunch. Mm. Um, number of people who communicate with people in other countries are very common. So what you end up is, with is hundreds of cases who look like they might just be worth investigating, mm. and then far too much work to do. Yeah, so I mean, isn't it, I mean, at, at the moment, I mean, anybody who uses the, the internet will be sort of irritatingly aware that it is. It is, you know, if you book a car once, then suddenly in the corner of your thing, you get lots and lots of car yeah. adverts suddenly appear. But, um, but, but that works because people are looking for broad patterns, they're looking for groups uh, of people. Yeah, but, and advertising is cheap. You know, you can target thousands of people in the hope that one of them buys a product. You can't do that with uh, criminal investigations because you need to intensively target and investigate the individual you've identified in order to find out whether they are really the sort of person that you're after. To say that point, that makes this quite a dangerous bill, in effect. If you're genuinely up to no good, it's always been the case that you'll find new ways to ensure that you don't get caught. And so this bill could actually just drive the people who are up to no good into what we call dark nets. They're not going to use these buzzwords and the things that they now know the government are going to be looking for in, in their communications, or they're just going to find new ways to communicate with each other. So this is just purely targeting the innocent and, and I guess, the incompetent if they, if they, don't, if they don't do that themselves.
themselves. So how likely is it to actually hit the statute books in anything like its current form? We'd like to hope not. <laughs> I mean, uh, from what we've heard from um, backbenchers and um, other members of parliament, they very much doubt that what, we, what we've seen now is what's going to actually get to their house. Like I say, there's going to be a consultation, um, it'll be redrafted, and then obviously the Lords will take a look at it and hopefully they'll get rid of anything that doesn't really, really um, meet the standards that the Commons should be looking at. Mm, and what's the Liberal Democrats' position on this? Because they you know, traditionally like to present themselves as, as the guardians of, of civil liberties and to have an interest in this. How's that working in terms of coalition politics? So we have uh, actually the, the two groups of people who are being really good about this at the moment are the sort of libertarian right of the Conservative Party who are both against big state, uh, they're against wasting government money, which, you know, frankly, this just looks like billions of pounds and a blank check to security uh, firms. Um, and parts of the Liberal Democrats who, again, are worried, I think, both about their own reputation and about what the coalition is pushing forward. Uh, I think what's happened here is that we've had, we have a Home Office um, and people in the Home Office, officials, frankly, who've been pushing this and can sort of tap on the minister's shoulder and say, the next time London gets bombed, if you haven't gathered this data, it'll be your fault those people died. Mm. And most ministers faced with that are pretty frightened and think, well, you know, collecting data versus my reputation in the future about having effectively let terrorists kill people, you know, there's no contest. I'm just going to collect, get the data collected. So politically, it's extremely easy to push politicians in the direction of this stuff, uh, especially if you've got knowledge of terrorists and can sort of look, you know, into the... Uh, into the sort of dark pits of the minister's eyes and sort of frighten their souls, um, you know. And that, so that's what happens. But I, I, I think at the same time, these, these projects have been repeatedly shown to be uh, extreme um, and unworkable. Um, and I think the coalition will have a, a, a big fight on its hands about this. I, I don't think it's a done deal by any means, but I do think uh, whatever happens, we're going to have a government that has given uh, countries like uh, China um, and other countries with uh, you know, human rights uh, problems a great deal of comfort. You know, there'll be the, the people in uh, you know, P Putin's government will be sort of uh, you know, wringing their hands and saying, well, you know, great, the UK wants to surveil their population just as much as we do. Next time they complain, we'll remind them of the things that they've suggested doing for their own citizens. Mm. So, I mean, you know, the way Jim describes it is a kind of politically driven thing rather than um, the, the, you know, the, there's a, a kind of caucus within government that wants to impose 1984 a little after the debt sell by date. Is that how you see it? And if you see it like that, what are the dangers that it will leak into surveillance of legitimate political protest, for instance? Yeah, I mean, we've got to remember this is not the first time that we've seen this um, kind of introduced as policy. This was first discussed in 2008 under New Labour by um, then Home Secretary Jackie Smith. And both the Conservative and Liberal Democrat parties were outraged, or seemingly outraged, that this could uh, possibly be even discussed in a, in a democratic society. And this is this is exactly as you say this is going to put us in the same kind of same kind of um, surveillance state as, as the likes of China and I think it was back in December that China actually praised um, the current government about their new uh, the new take on the internet and surveillance and they were going to have to be very careful about the company that we're starting to keep and the the movement that we're starting to make in terms of the internet and surveillance and as you said it makes it very difficult for us to then turn to these countries on subjects like uh, on subjects like human rights and and surveillance and um, being a bit more democratic and open as a society to then turn to these, to turn to these um, states and, and, and try and, I guess, um, ask, them, ask them to be a bit more like us. And it, we're, we're losing, our, losing the right foot on this, I think. Mm. Yeah. Jim, do you, do you think, it, if it's implemented, do you think it will be, will be used in a more general political way? Well, I, th I think if it's implemented, uh, we will see um, people moving to encryption. Uh, I think a lot of the companies will be incredibly upset um, I think I don't think um, a Facebook, a Google, a Yahoo wants a copy of all the data from all of its uh, customers to be replicated in servers belonging to British Telecom and uh, Talk Talk that it has no security control over at all. I don't think they want that. I think they would worry about it from a competition point of view, but I also think they would worry about it from the point of view of the security and safety of their users. I think users would be incredibly worried about it too. So I think people will quickly move to ways to stop all of this working. And then we'll get into a battle about 
can we decrypt this information? Can we, does the government have a right to remove your security uh, if you try to uh, be secure on the internet? And that will then threaten banking, it'll threaten commerce. So I think, you know, bluntly, this is a disaster waiting to happen on, on many, many levels. And that's what makes it defeatable. Um, the thing that makes it difficult is that these are technical issues. They're difficult for politicians to get their head around compared to terrorists and paedophiles stalking the net. Um, and that makes it very important that British citizens stand up for their rights, uh, talk to their MPs and make it absolutely apparent that they do not want this threatening their safety um, and their liberty on the internet. Mm. And uh, and what just uh, so that viewers know, um, Emma, what are the stages now that the that this legislation has got to go through? In other words, what's the time scale if people uh, are, are engaged in opposition to it? Yeah, well, from what we understand, they're going to move quite quickly on this in terms of the consultation period. I don't think they have announced on exactly how long that's going to be. But as you just mentioned, we, we are going to be encouraging people to write to their MPs. We're going to have a um, a, a draft of that um, uh, that people can download from our website and send to MPs um, detailing what this means and um, why people are generally concerned if your viewers are interested in that. And I think if people um, or, and organisations put as much pressure as they can on the government to say just what a bad idea this actually is, then hopefully we'll see a very con a very watered down version of this um, get, to the, get to the House, if anything at all. OK, well, thank you both very much. That brings us to the close of uh, part one of the Politics and Media Show. But do join us for part two. Welcome back to the Politics and Media Show. A helpline for Muslim youngsters has been suspended after its CAO has resigned amid a furious row over the apparent forwarding of confidential information of volunteers to anti-terror police. The Muslim Youth Health Helpline has been suspended because the private emails were leaked to a blog site detailing a breach of confidentiality. The volunteers say that they are shocked and disgusted at being reported to the police and deny any extremism. However, the charity's former CEO, Akila Ahmed, claimed that those calling for her resignation were racists, homophobes and extremists. In the latest twist in the saga, her husband, Nafiz Musadek Ahmed, wrote a detailed blog explaining the events as he saw them. He outlined what he saw as the reasons for his making a mistake in going to the police. In the blog, Ahmed describes what he saw as a criminal campaign against the charity by some staff, but also admits his response could have been wiser. Well, to try and make sense of this, and to also assess some of the wider implications for the Muslim community, with me in the studio is writer and journalist Asad Beg, and on the phone we have Nabil Ahmed, the president of the Muslim student body, FOSIS. Uh, welcome to the programme. Asad, so what's at, the, what's at the heart of this? Is this, is this something more than a, a, a sort of row among staff in a in a charity organisation? I think it started off as maybe a row, an internal conflict. But what the emails indicate, and I think what they show is, that the CEO, feeling threatened maybe for her position, thought, what can I do to stop this? And she turned to the police. And I think it's hard for anyone from the outside to kind of understand that how somebody in her position and in her husband's position, the director of a think tank, could possibly not realise the connotations the word extremist has when you put that forward to the police. And when the police forwarded it to SO15, the Counterterrorism Command, this must have set alarm bells ringing that these people are your employees, their members, yet you're using the word extremist for them. How are the police going to see this? Mm. So, so for you, I mean, what's, what's wrong in this train of events is not necessarily that, that somebody who feels threatened may go, to the, may go to the police. They may be wrong or they may be right about being threatened. But if there's something to investigate, then it's legitimate for them to go to the police. What's, what's, what's different is that you accuse people not of harassing you or, or something like this, but of, of bringing in a political charge of extremism. I think after 9-11, after 7-7, you know, the Muslim community has been in the spotlight. We've had, you know, terror raids. And it's too easy, it's just far too easy for someone to pick up the phone and they have a personal grievance to say, this, this person, this individual is an extremist or a terrorist. And I think that the wider issue here is Muslim organisations, organisations that are there to serve the community, about their relationship with the police. This Nafis's email to the police officer was somebody he knew. And the police officer said, OK, it's coming from you, therefore I understand it. I value your judgment, I value your experience and knowledge. So we, we, throughout the Muslim community, we have people 
taking money. I don't know if Nafis has taken money from Prevent. I, you know, that's that, that isn't. Uh, there's no evidence for that. But there's organisations that take money from Prevent from the police and have this kind of relationship. That's the, there's no transparency or accountability over it. So these Muslim Muslim organisations taking money from Prevent and have this close relationship to the police, this close relationship with the Counter-Terrorism Command, who are essentially looking for information, looking for spies, looking for people that they can target. Mm. Nabil, uh, let me just bring you into the discussion. Um, do you think, as, as, as Asad is suggesting there, that w whatever the, the truth or otherwise about, uh, about this particular case and whether or not the charity involved was part of the PREVENT scheme, uh, do you think it's correct that the PREVENT scheme um, has made this kind of incident um, more likely to take place? Sorry, John, can you just repeat that question? Yeah, I'm just asking you whether you think that the, the, the rolling out of the PREVENT scheme, which is a government-funded uh, scheme um, uh, against violent extremism, has made it more likely that in cases where it's not appropriate, um, people will make accusations about extremism. Absolutely. To be honest, uh, PREVENT has been an absolute shambles uh, for the government on the government's part to try to, quote-unquote, prevent extremism. But also, as we can tell from this example, and this is not the first time something like this has happened, uh, we can tell that prevents actually causing issues within Muslim communities as well. Uh, it's a result of that, actually, John, that uh, because I'm the president of a national student body, I'm democratically elected by students on the ground, I see, he, see, see hear, and feel what's going on. I was really just shocked to see that 25 innocent young Muslim names were handed over to police with these tags of extremism and, and the rest of it uh, labelled yeah. upon them. Uh, you know, and I wrote an open letter to basically say that you know, the Muslim Youth Helpline needed to apologise to them, that this shouldn't have happened, that there needs to be an investigation into this. Um, I think Assad's absolutely right in his analysis of uh, these labels getting thrown around so easily. It shouldn't have happened. I think what needs to happen now, though, to be honest, is that, number one, there needs to be a very clear, strong voice within the Muslim community to say that situations like this are just completely unacceptable. You cannot just hand over names of young, innocent Muslims to the police in such a way. Uh, number two, there are ways to deal with things. You know, uh, you know criminal activity, uh, there is the police for that, but that's very different to what's occurred in this instance here. Uh, I think there's a lot of learning. I think it's been a very, very, very messy week, but I think Assad's analysis was spot on there. So, so, so what you're saying is that uh, you know that this, that this, if there were anything to investigate here, uh, it should have stayed within the realm of sort of uh, accusations of criminal behaviour, not that there was some political dimension to this. Uh, this is true. Yeah. Look, firstly, I think uh, we're, and we're still learning, you know, we're still learning exactly what's been going on here. You know, we've been fed a little bit on blogs, um, you know, on Facebook and in and around it. Uh, I think we need to see all the information transpire. But what's been clear is that names were handed over uh, to to the police in such a manner. And uh, John, I, yeah, I really feel that uh, this is just, yeah, it's just completely unacceptable. Um, if you could just repeat the last bit of your question, so I could just catch that bit again. No, I was just saying that if it has to be, de if it has to be dealt with, if there is something to be dealt with here, then then it has to fall within the ambit of uh, of the criminal law, and that and that and that politically sensitive and charged terms like extremism, um, and indeed the anti-terror police shouldn't be really brought into it. Yeah, you're right. Look, number one, I think if there's, if there's workforce disputes going on, then there's internal mechanisms to deal with that sort of stuff in the first place uh, before you even get to the law. Now, if somebody feels that somebody is doing something potentially criminally related, then that's a matter for the law. But, you know, this is not the first time we've seen something like this happen, actually. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, at the University College London in the wake of the failed Detroit bomber plot, and he was a student who once went to University College London. Uh, the student union in that instance uh, just uh, deliberated in handing over the details of Muslim students to the police in that instance again. Uh, and obviously we've seen a similar sort of incident take place here. So I think there needs to be an absolutely transparent, complete and utter investigation into why this is happening, how this happened in this instance. Uh, and we need to give confidence as well, John, to young Muslims on the ground to say that you know what, your Muslim organisation is not doing this sort of stuff. This is why we spoke out so clearly about it. So, so Asad, um, 
I mean, perhaps the argument is then that, uh, rather as there's an understanding in many sections of the of the labour and trade union movement, that if there's an internal dispute, this isn't something that you go to the courts and you, isn't something that you go to the police about because people suspect an institutional bias, that there needs to be a sort of, uh, are you arguing that there should be a more widespread in, uh, understanding in the Muslim community along perhaps similar lines? I think so. I think that Muslims need to understand if there's an internal dispute that they, that it can be dealt with without going to the police. You know, I think that even in, let's look at this situation. It's a workplace. Um, the trade union should have been involved. Was there a trade union movement there? If there wasn't, why isn't there? Because I could see these problems not escalating if there was a trade union there. And I think that there needs to be that involvement within the Muslim community. But I also think on a wider note is that these kind of things that are taking place, handing over of people's details, police feeling brazen enough to contact, for example, student union presidents or the head of uh, Islamic societies or individuals within them, asking them to spy for them, has led to a situation where Muslims are scared to come out. And you know, for the viewers that are watching now, I'd like to say to them that, that your protection and your security is when you speak out, speak to people, tell them that this is taking place, don't remain silent. Because if you are approached by the police for information, uh, and if they do ask you to do things, they should speak out, they should speak to a journalist that they trust, maybe me, uh, but also they should speak to people within the community, speak to the trade union rep uh, at work, speak to the uh, lecturer who they trust, speak to your student unions officer that you trust. And I think this isn't taking place because essentially Muslims are scared. They're scared to speak out because they may be called a radical or extremist. They're afraid, some of them are afraid to demonstrate, to say anything that's maybe anti-establishment because they may be called a radical. Because I remember a time years ago, and maybe you can as well, John, where actually being called radical was a compliment. Mm. Uh, and, and it was a part of the movement. Everyone wanted to be radical. And right now, if you're called radical and you're non-Muslim, it's different. And if you're called radical, if you're Muslim, it's totally different. Mm. You're seen as an extremist. Mm. So, uh, I mean, we've been talking about uh, how people should, should, should react to this pressure. But let, 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 let's talk about the, the origins of this, because we're talking about what are, what are perhaps mistaken or, or, or at least debatable reactions to this. But the, but the problem doesn't stem with the people doing the reacting. The problem stems, does it not, from the, from the climate of fear that's being created about, around these issues? Definitely. I think that if you look at after 9-11 and 7-7, this, this, these wars, the wars that we saw abroad, you can see a direct link, as far as I'm concerned, with the increase of Islamophobia. Then also an increase of Muslim communities fearing that they are under attack. So that means that you have, from the wider population, there's this scaremongering about Muslims. You know, that a Muslim stopped the bus because he wanted to pray, or a Muslim woman in niqab is somehow a threat. Um, you know, with a few inches of cloth across her face, you know, a, 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 you know, seasoned politicians going to feel uh, intimidated or uncomfortable with that. Uh, then we also see within Muslims a fear to speak out. If you speak out, the message is very clear. If you speak out, if you say anything against war, if you say anything against racism, Islamophobia, if you dare to be an activist, then you are a target. And I think there's a lack of understanding. And until the wider population uh, understand that Muslims are not a threat and they have just as much rights as everybody else, that will reduce radicalism and it will uh, reduce the fear amongst the Muslim community to be able to be, uh, speak out and become uh, or get, in, get, get engaged with the wider part of society. Mm -hmm. Bill, um, from your experience, is, is that a picture that, uh, that you recognise, the picture that Assad's just, just, just painted of the, of the origins of this uh, uh, in, in the larger society? Uh, yeah, no, I think this is a very fair reflection, actually. I remember, uh, John, actually, one example at one university where a student came up to us um, and he came to us, he said, is it okay for me to read this book that I found in the library? Because I don't, I don't want to potentially get into any trouble. Um, and this is a, it was a well-known book that was stocked in a library. And this, this young gentleman who was at university was scared of reading this book, picking up this book, for fear that something may happen to him uh, in relation from, from the police. And there have been incidents where stuff has happened as well. And I think that, that fear is very real. And it's happened in the post-77 climate of suspicion. And I think Assad touched upon this um, already. And I think this is, this is why we need this confidence to shape our political discourse to say, actually, you know what, 
um, being radical, being outspoken, challenging the status quo is actually what a democracy is all about. But I don't think the British government and both successive governments have been able to have that confidence about that. And I was remembering just actually David Cameron's speech, uh, his multiculturalism speech, which actually just so, showed that intolerance to dissent, uh, which his predecessors uh, showed as well. I think on the other hand, though, John, and I, I'm going to say this as well at the same time, that I, uh, and I, I know there's not that many, maybe less people like this, but people like myself, for example, maybe Assad as well, one of the reasons I do this sort of work, um, uh, you know, this youth work, is because I actually believe that, you know, in this post-77 environment, it's more and more and more important for people to actually stand up and, you know, be able to voice their opinions in a time when we need it most. Um, and I know there's many other people who have felt that as well. So I think one, one thing we sometimes say to young people, actually, is that, hey, it's better to be part of these organizations, uh, be part of the active student movement or the active youth Muslim organizations, because then actually, you know what, you're part of the change, you're clear, you're, you know, it's, you're seen, um, and you're protected as well by being uh, usually part of Muslim organizations uh, like ours. Mm. Because, I mean, there is, a, there is a sensation which is induced that, uh, you know, a kind of, if we're just quiet, if we, if we keep our heads down, then, you know, then, um, you know, then we'll be left alone. It, but, but, I mean, it, it, you know, if, if we look generally politically, it, it doesn't look that way. I mean, we, we're in a week after elections in Greece and France where fascist parties have entered the national parliaments for the first time since the the Second World War, second time in, in France, and in France where they campaigned on an openly um, Islamophobic platform. So, I mean, uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't quite the case that if you say nothing, things will simply improve their own volition. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. And I think at a deeper level, John, um, I think partly it is about standing up and speaking out and so forth. Um, and I say this on a, you know, a Muslim community channel as well, but it's, it's also about speaking to our neighbors, um, which Muslims should know well about, which is really, really what we're about. I remember in my old workplace, and I just give this very quick example, um, I, I worked with, and it was, it was a warehouse, so people really, you could say more from a working class background, and the lady who I got to know um, a year after knowing me, and we really got to know each other, she said, thank God for speaking to me, because I used to think that Muslims were all terrorists because of what I have to read in the media and what I'm constantly fed. Um, and I thought that was a really profound example. I thought, you know, just by speaking to our neighbours, that you know, we have to make that that mm. effort to to speak to other people. And I think that's that's part of our religion as well. So uh, I think there's there's a political issue here, but there's also a community talking to our neighbours. And I think sometimes uh, this form of exchange uh, is quite a powerful one, actually. Mm. So have you any feeling about about where this particular case is going? Have you got any idea how this will play out with the police now that this whole the whole sort of process behind it has been brought out into the public. Well, I, when I contacted the police and asked them for comment, uh, they, the officer in question didn't want to comment, so I had to go through the press office and try and get some comment, and they sent, just said that they were investigating. Um, I know that there's, got, there's been a meeting, uh, the trustees are looking at what's happening in trying to rebuild the confidence, um, but I think there's a wider issue here, and the wider issue is what happens when these things come out in public and Muslims begin to lose trust in those organisations. And I think that uh, Muslim Youth Helpline is a good, it's, it's good organisation. It's done a lot of good work. I think it's up to the people involved now to kind of rebuild that trust. Um, but I think, should there be more accountability for the people that passed on the details? I think so. Uh, other than resigning, what's actually happened? Mm. How do you think it, how, uh, it, it, it's, I mean, it sounds like it's a long way down the road in this particular, in this particular charity. Do you think there's a, do you think there's a, a possibility of, uh, of reclaiming the trust, of rebuilding the trust, as you say? I think there's always that possibility. I think that uh, the way that has to be done is the trustee board and the charity have to strongly distance themselves from what's happened um, and start anew and try to kind of rebuild that confidence. I think they have to say that, look, this is unacceptable what's happened. Uh, we don't condone this in any way, shape or form. We didn't know that this had happened. Now that we know, we will ensure and put uh, measures in place to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Mm. Nabil, I mean, we did ask people from the from the charity to come on, but the but the but they uh, wouldn't field somebody. Uh, what do you feel is the, the solution here? Do you think uh, Assad's right? Do you think that um, these are the measures that could rebuild trust in this case? 
Yeah, I, I put some measures. Uh, I recommended some measures actually for them to rebuild trust, and I'll touch upon that in just one second. But I, I'm a little bit disappointed actually that they haven't come on uh, to the channel again. I, I know there was another show on Islam Channel on Thursday as well, and I think it would just help the charity if they didn't just hide behind uh, the television screen. We actually spoke up because I think people want to hear from the charity itself. Look, uh, John, I think in terms of the charity, I think it's. Ri I, I work at the, on the Muslim youth community grassroots level, and I know how important Muslim Youth Helpline is. It's a tremendously important charity. And I think the effort of everybody um, it needs to be to, in, to rebuild trust, um, to get this organization going again. But to be able to do that, what I've recommended them is that they need to bring in advice from key trusted Muslim community figures. They need to, I think, the board has been in a very challenging position. I think some of them need to move on, just for the good of the organization. They didn't condone what happened at all, actually, and they condemned it. Uh, eventually. Um, but I think to rebuild trust in the organization, some of them need to move on so that new people can come in and the organization can have a new feel, a fresh feel, and move on from what happened. Um, they've already apologized uh, to the 25 names that were passed on, uh, which was the right thing to do, although they took uh, a really long time to do it, which is a bit unfortunate. And like Assad said, they need to really distance themselves from what happened. Um, I, I think one thing that I really strongly feel is that uh, with organizations like this, we can't just depend upon the organization rebuilding. And I think it's something Sometimes very easy to criticize and condemn and everything else. And I've been very clear in what I thought about what happened as well. But I think it's important that we do what we can to support this important charity to get going as well. Okay. Um, I said, uh, all right, we've talked a little bit about what, what might be done in this particular case. Uh, and we've talked something about the general conditions in which this kind of thing happens. Uh, you mentioned particularly the Prevent Scheme. Now, the Prevent Scheme's had a very you know, checkered history. It, and it was brought in by the last Labour government. Towards the end of that government, it was panned by a select committee. It looked as if it was going to be dropped. The Tories said they were going to drop it, but the coalition government has kind of come out with a, a son of prevent scheme. W would the environment where this has happened um, be changed for the better and make it less likely for it to be repeated if the prevent scheme was scrapped? Absolutely. I think if the prevent scheme was scrapped, then uh, I think Muslim communities could have more confidence. Uh, right now, what we're seeing is Muslim organisations falling over themselves, uh, and not all of them, some of them, uh, trying to get this money from prevent. You know, they, they want the money for their charities and they'll say, look, we're all experts in extremism now, in terrorism and radicalization. Give us the money and we'll tell you what the problem is or we'll sort it out for you. Um, and that approach doesn't work because essentially money comes with strings attached. And those strings mean you pass on information, you tell them who's a radical. And, and, and the idea of radical is very, very uh, broad and sometimes tied to kind of the establishment. So, for example, if someone says, I'm not going to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee. Are you a radical? Are you Islamic extremist? Where someone says, I disagree with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and we think uh, we should pull out. Are, are you a radical extremist? Or if someone believes that Muslims shouldn't join the British military, are you a radical extremist? And I think that th this money comes with those strings attached. So the best thing that could happen is for the prevent scheme to be scrapped, but more transparency and, and accountability within the Muslim community and kind of confidence building measures to help youngsters come out and feel part of society and feel like their opinion is a valid opinion and it will be listened to. OK, well, Nabil um, Assad, thanks very much for uh, discussing the issue. That brings us to the close of this edition of the Politics and Media Show, but I hope that you'll be back with us next week.